Hello, everyone. Um, I can see no one, so I hope I hope I hope you all can hear me. Now I can see faces. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Meet Your Uni event series. Um, as many of you might already know, we started this event series last winter semester. So this post event uh, effect. So uh, semester, this time, besides professors and members of the Mittelbau assistants, and to invite side into their work. It will be followed by a dialogue between our guests and uh, the public is invited to, to intervene with questions. And the whole discussion will be moderated by Gonzalo. After teaching at Oxford Brooks, he is currently committed to his doctoral thesis at the University of Innsbruck. And besides that, he's teaching at the, so besides teaching in Innsbruck at the Institut für Experimentelle Architektur Hochbau, He's also teaching environmental design strategies in the bio-integrated design program at Bartlett. His research and design experiments explore the relationship between the built and the natural environment through layering materials and environmental simulations. Special interest is given to the impact of weather on surfaces and their, net and their textural articulations. And the third guest, Mumun Kayser, is an architecture graduate based in Innsbruck, interested in speculative art and computational design based on the user. During his studies and career, he also held work based on the user. During his studies and career, he also held workshops in architectural design, computational design, storytelling, and visualization. Um, well, it seems like I'm since a very long time at this faculty now. Um, I guess everyone knows uh, the institute where I'm working, so I will not present too closely. I will try to give a little bit of insight what drives me and um, what is my research aim or why am I doing certain things. Um, it turned out that 15 minutes uh, is a short amount of time to, to explain what you try to do in a faculty or, or what, what drives you in your research. Um, so, well, I, let me start with this. So basically, I guess um, my research and my practice and my teaching, this is all overlapping field. So there's no um, clear boundary in, in between these things. So I'm, 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 I, I love to teach, I love to build. Um, I, all, all these things I'm really enjoying uh, uh, doing these things so from computation methods to to work with with real materials as wood or paper or what, whatever it is um, so it's a bit of a clear boundary between that so also the things I will show today um, is probably more research cardboard so but what else can you do with cardboard? So sometimes uh, it happens that uh, last autumn I, I was able, to, sometimes as a consultant, um, I was very happy to help uh, uh, the guys from Park Art um, to build up this uh, uh, pavilion in Kirchdorf in Tirol. So I was there just um, trying to help a little bit out with folding, which is probably, as you will see, one of my main topics because it's, it's a very good... Um, um, field because it's it's very complex and and it has many insights on fabrication um, on on holistic uh, approaches to to architecture and fabrication. So in general, I'm dealing with and what I'm uh, interesting is is all these things. It's computation design. If you look at it, so this uh, fabrication scheme. There's a structural scheme. There's a formal scheme. All all together. So um, all these things are interrelated and in order to to have control on such a system um i am working with something that is known as simplexity and uh simplexity is a way make complex things uh simple as the name says but i think it's also a method to generate and control complex informed systems and if you know everything must be as exact as it is in mathematics. So 
Um, looking at complex informed systems, um, maybe mm, my something I discovered is origami, something that uh, has very strict rules. So square sheet paper, uh, three-dimensional shape uh, that's made just through folding. And important, so modern origami artists would say uh, no cut, no glue, no markings on paper. Um, so I'm not sure if that's true for architects, but uh, why I like it so much is if you look at these things, so um, Yoshisawa Rendlet developed a system where you could just, through um, a simple uh, language, see how the fold should be done. So all the much uh, that you have just giving in these instructional things. So are architects doing, so architects are basically disrupting system. So I guess I'm um, not using square of paper. I'm not using paper all the time. Um, we do cuts, we glue, we things uh, we are doing and kind of expanding the system by breaking the rules a little bit. Um, they's reviewed, for example, by Eric Demain and us, uh, how these things really work. And some of the models, they it's really difficult to uh, manipulate something and you can be faster. So how can that be applied for architecture? So basically um, the right technique, uh, it, it is possible to, to generate a paper model and then really transfer this knowledge uh, into another material, in this case, wood. Um, so I guess this approach uh, from a physical model through, of course, a digital model and a computational method behind it, um, but it has a huge potential. And of course, I'm, I'm not the only one who's doing something, but I guess uh, in 2016, there was an exhibition a little bit did. Um, we're currently working uh, on the development on a grasshopper component that can do curved folds, which is uh, relatively new. Besides of uh, some kangaroo models, where you could just distribute the, uh, I think, a good strategy. But if you want to have a, a better and more correct uh, um, handling uh, of testing or, or yeah, do bug reports, just try it out how it works. So I guess, um, I don't know, within a few weeks, we hopefully um, can publish uh, this um, version or first version to see if uh, other people are also interested in curved folding who think that other people are also interested. To this, um, why do I think it's bad for architecture? I guess it's one thing that means you can bring stuff directly to a site, for example, in flat state. Um, we tried out uh, this in a, in a very uh, simple attempt. So we just had this um, conical element. We brought it to a site in, in France. Important thing is that we learned that it works. So if you that in a in a in a big scale, then I don't know. Maybe someone would come with a long strip of material, and you could just fold it up, have something that you could work with. Of course, this particular structure has holes, so maybe a surface approach would be good. So there's lots of Curved folding patterns. This one is particularly interesting. It's uh, the so called lens tessellation. Huffman um, was investigated by uh, some other people, but what is important there, you see, there is this height um, that forms uh, a full element. And well, Huffman was trying to, or was folding anti surfaces. If you fold just parts of it, then uh, you could assemble the folded parts and make something else out of it. Um, formal way than just uh, flat or or um, arc like sheets. Uh, um, also, we're supporting the the current research project. So, but in the first attempt, we just needed to see if you fold single individual elements and assemble them to uh, a structure. So, for the fifty years uh, party of of the company, we we could do this. But the question: if you could fold an entire uh, uh, part of a building or, for example, a bridge. So 
in uh, 2019, we tried to do this. Um, of course, there's lots of geometry uh, behind this. Um, I will not go too deep to the detail. Um, the only thing that is important that we replace some folding part with a slit or with a cut um, to uh, have a faster assemble. And then, of course, it's made from different parts. Uh, there are a lot of milling, like milled in, I guess, a day and assembled in a day. And then you have something like this. And well, um, just would like to show that if you have the right knowledge of a very complex system and you can simplify it uh, in a very easy way, then it's possible to transfer knowledge in this case from paper and geometry and origami. And uh, it's kind of all there already, sort of a fable for wobbly complex shapes. Well, sort of in 2010, I was in my first year of studying architecture at TU Wien. And after realizing that my delusion of studying mechanical engineering was something I could not sustain long enough. Um, uh, so as the little brother back then, still am, but for purposes. Um, at the backside of the Austrian pavilion, though, uh, there was this exhibition of student work for uh, of a variety of schools, which was back then run by Marcus Cruz and Marian Coletti. And they later became my teachers, and I owe them a lot. And somewhere in that ex architecture, and around 2017 then, I figured that I really enjoyed academia, and I sort of innocently started writing papers. And then a position at Hofbau was opened, and I applied. Well, now I sit right here, actually. Funny enough, it's the only photo I took of that visit to Innsbruck. And I got a bit better at writing, too, I think, at least. And I'm now, as mentioned in the introduction, an assistant at Hofbau while doing my PhD. As a student, I'm also a member of the transdisciplinary doctoral program organizing the digital, uh, which spans across several uh, faculties here. And as a lecturer, I'm part of the Designing Future Realities postgraduate program at University of Innsbruck. I currently teach also, as I said before, at the Bartlett at Environmental Design, and I've done a couple of workshops here and there. So now being a researcher and trying a bit to, to follow up what we had as a discussion before with Rupert and Mumin, um, what it's about. I'm also sort of interested in these imperfections, as Rupert said before. Um, I, my research, I'm investigating the digital material interfaces between the natural and the built environment. Uh, and my work sort of focus lies on shapes, colors, climates, textures, and materials, to mention a few buzzwords, and that define those thresholds. I'm exploring both theory both in theory and through applications using digital tools and workflows, which I think we all three of us have in common. I work a lot with fragments and specimens. There's two terms I really started enjoying over the last years. And they're fabricated scale models and elements and parts. They're of textures and materials, of colors and shapes and layers. And I investigate what happens when you take digital shapes out of their high precision context, when you fabricate a smooth surface with a crude tool, when you observe them through different technological lenses, and the results then are reliefs, terrains, and landscapes. So there's a jump in scale. I furthermore hold a big interest in materials and new ways we have to investigate them using technology. May this be a sort of thermal vision or machine learning? like this little experiment which intended to find an approach towards notions of place. Specifically, I'm interested in the interplay of planned, intended, and weathered notions of time and use in regards of textured surfaces. Here on the left, the photo of the calcified crust of a 16th century fountain in Rome. On the right, a multi-layered thermocrist to tell us about the weather. Like the one on the left, the roof of St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome, the clad, uh, the, the, the land, these roof lanterns are clad with lead and the water leaves traces while running over over the centuries. On the right, again, a thermochromic surface, which does this instantaneously sort of respond, but also the actual close-up of material compositions like these striated layers of sinter in the ornamental incrustation of an interior of a church in Rome. Here, yeah, changing surfaces can be programmed to highlight specific architectural features of situations. A sort of climatic ornament, careful with that term, but
but how can uh, discussion on the role of color in architecture to meaningfully highlight features? It's not about what color or material is used, but how they are used as a sort of working title. And it's kind of mediating display, which is used to predict flow patterns in different fluid simulations. And the one quote of Friedrich Schiller's um, Wilhelm Tell, which loosely translated means the X in the house saves you the carpenter. So also part of uh, the fact. And that was also the last time I had a close tennis uh, on the last slide, or actually to John Ruskin. Uh, a few weeks ago, I came across this aquarel painting on the left from 1871. Over to the discussion. Thank you. So hello everyone. I think it's now my turn to share my screen. So let me see. Okay, uh, my name is Mimin Kesa, and as Florina already mentioned, I recently graduated from University of Innsbruck a few months ago. And today I'm going to talk about a few about a, a few projects of mine and also my diploma thesis and how my the recent works of mine. So philosophers, a lot of theorists and um, psychologist and stuff like that and one of the main directed by our own self and nowadays even or hers own a digital footprint and these cyberspaces or in this cyberspace our behavior actions choices have been monitored saved and by their ai systems algorithm processed and since the boom, social media has been manipulating our minds by showing us stuff uh, which mainly focuses on our interests. So the tool we are using to enhance our daily lives is actually using us as tools. And our addiction towards social media is based on this data, where the AI behind it knows us better than we know ourselves sometimes. And it can predict our next action and thus create experiences that drive us more into using social media. So this is one of the reasons why I kind of use this kind of a logic of the social media in our architecture, in our architectural design process. So we are not only led into new frontiers now, but also forced to live in a world of hyper-reality, a world in which we cannot distinguish between what is real or what is not real. Uh, so this is not a really big deal for us. As Michael Heim in his work, Metaphysics of Virtual Reality stated, the world rendered as poor information not only fascinates our eyes and minds, but also captures our hearts. We feel augmented and empowered. Our hearts beat in the machines. This is Eros. So Michael Heim sees our uh, relationship to technology, some kind of a marriage. Uh, marriage. And so that, that's why this whole, all this manipulation is uh, not really a big deal for us because we don't really care. Once we are happily married to technology and live a life where we can do so many things in a short amount of time and be anywhere, everywhere, virtually or in real, you're okay with it. So these cyberspaces are an important tool in our lives today and we cannot move forward without them. And also another uh, architect or a theorist who also inspired me a lot was Marcus Novak with his work like Liquid Architectures. And in his work, he stated that cyberspace is architecture. Cyberspace has an architecture and cyberspace contains architecture, which means as architects, we also have to uh, embrace cyberspace, dive into it and start creating spaces in there as well, or start creating architecture in there as well. So I took, so I took everything that I gained as a theoretical knowledge and put it into this diagram. And here, this kind of a pro, uh, I just wanted to show how this kind of a perception of a space by a user functions. 
and how I'm using these processes in order to create this kind of a Hyperion space as a simulated fusion. Because this is mostly based on embodied simulation of a space, which helps us to emphasize with a space as a user. And, <clears throat> and this also kind of provokes actions and actions shape experiences with the help of memory, personality, and emotions we can kind of create this kind of a stimulation or manipulation of the user. And also for me personally, architecture should not deal with the construction of a building, but really be, rather be considered as body building. Architecture as a body can be enhanced as room to grow and the possibility to free itself from the functional enslavement of the users. So it could not only adapt to the user and his or her needs, but it would also maintain a physical and mental proximity to the user. So from that, I ask myself the questions about what if architecture begins to be an extension of our body or what happens when we use our existence as a bridge between architecture and body to bring those two things together. So the project is not only about relationship between real and virtual, but also about the search for new ways to implement immaterial digital qualities into the physical and material based world of architecture. So the simulations or rather the virtual face can be seen as a medium in their dynamic character and they're constantly changing architectural expression. So from this whole idea, I created this kind of an algorithm where I use uh, point clouds as an input, not just as a representation or um, simulation of the real world, and also not just for orientation sake, but also for um, a point cloud is a data, and this data can be manipulated further. And here I kind of create it's four steps. density of this point cloud. Then I add personality type data, emotion data, and user activity data to create this personal space of a user. I hope the video works fine. So here is a quick movie about the whole design approach. So again, you can see the gradient vector calculation of this point clouds that I'm inserting. I'm, and this is mainly based on a, or based on density of this point cloud. So the way you also um, create or scan this environment is also really important. Then on the second phase, here you can see the input point cloud. And here is the output of this gradient vector field. Then on the second phase, phase, I introduce personality type data where I use MBTI personality types. And this, I, I convert this data into vectors. And I also use these vectors as a starting point of each vector field. So the starting point of each simulation will be defined by the personality type data, as you can see in this animation here. And then on, on third phase, I introduce emotion data, which is based on the blue cheek emotion wheel. And from this, um, from this emotion wheel, I extract two data types, emotion strength and emotion pole. And I introduce them also into the whole simulation or into this whole algorithm. And as you can see, I now get... So the next goal for me was to create this kind of an installation to kind of showcase this whole idea into a real uh, environment. And here again, I use as a base, uh, again, this gradient vector field of this point cloud. And I put it into an engine and really kind of create the same algorithm in there too. And here you can see the parameters change and with the change of the parameters, the space changes as well in real time. And here is the real space. That, that I put into the engine or whether set the experience. And here are some visuals how this may look, but also a video of the experience. Again, I can move a little bit forward with the video. And as you can see, you can change the parameters and the whole simulation change, changes in real time. And you can also, by moving your hands, you can also change the appearance of the vectors or better set the whole um, lines as well, or the, better set the length as well. Ooh. 
sorry. I pressed the wrong key. So I also used, used the same idea to kind of for the final presentation. And I uh, scanned the whole uh, Hochbau Institute and also put it inside this uh, system. And here is a showcase with some users in it. And you can really walk around everything. The accuracy of the scanned data is pretty good. So you can go around, touch things. You can sit on things and really, uh, you can sit on things and really interact with the space. And this space should be a really a hyper space. You should kind of feel the reality and also the virtuality in it. And it was kind of interesting to see the interaction from the user uh, from the users as well because after a few minutes you your perceptual um, systems uh, adjust themselves into the space and you feel really real because the space that you are that you were uh, before you put on the headset is in in the simulation as well and so this kind of makes this kind of a, a contradicting emotion of the user and. The only thing what drove some users crazy was that I was talking to them while they were inside. So they were like, I can hear, but I can see you. And this makes me kind of uh, go crazy. And this was kind of a really interesting to see. So now I'm going to talk about a few other works that I do. So this was it for my diploma. So I also. During the process of the whole uh, diploma thesis, I also experimented with this kind of idea of really um, much more interaction with the user and the space as well, so or the virtual space as well. So I had this kind of tests. And I also kind of used, again, a real environment to create something different in virtual. Some, uh, For example, this column, everyone knows this column, I think. And I kind of created this kind of a really uncanny column out of it. And again, created an experience where I used, again, this kind of a logic. And you can really go ahead, touch the column and this kind of stuff. And this, it feels real because you can touch it, but it is not. So you have, again, this contradicted uh, feeling about it. You can also kind of activate some attraction and the, all this particles or all this uh, the simulation is attracted attract, attracted to your left hand uh, on a degree so you can move around the whole simulation a little bit and on some point after a few moments or after a few minutes when you're inside you start to adjust to that and this particle field starts to feel real on some point because it's kind of feel like something uh, smoky or it feels like smoke that you can push around and so it kind of it was really interesting to see how your perception perception of the space changes or the feel of the space changes. So now I'm also more interested in some works that I I'm doing now. Again, this was also the idea for my diploma as well. I'm using some deaf cameras to also scan the environment in real time and create this kind of uh, simulations. And here. An experiment of mine, as you can see, uh, this camera is attached to your view, so it collects or scans the environment in real time, and it immediately creates a simulation on top of it. So I think on this view, you can't see it, but I can just go forward. You can also change the, change the appearance, this kind of stuff. And here you can see it's in 3D, and you can really... And the accuracy is pretty crazy. You can really touch things. For example, on the start, you can see I kind of pick up my phone as well or pick up these kind of thing, things and the accuracy is pretty, pretty crazy. And you can see, I think when the two images are side by side, you can see it, I think that uh, I hope the videos are not that buggy. So I also scaled this whole thing up and kind of created this three-dimensional. Uh, I also used, again, the Hochbau Institute uh, model here as well. So 
what happens if we also create these kind of uh, spaces out of this kind of canvas? Like really in real time, you can create this kind of uh, manipulation of this kind of simulation in real time and we really access the whole space with that. And because of all these elements inside of the space, these real elements from the space, the feeling of uncanny and canny kind of pops up and you start to feel some contradicted emotions and reactions. And here again, a uh, few experiments in that way. So now out of all this stuff, I also working on some further exper experiences. Uh, this is uh, this out of body experiences. The first one was story. Again, I use data as a starting point. Again, this smartphone data. And here I'm mostly interested in how I can use this kind of a data as a starting point of a simulation. Like here, for example, all this collected data from a, from a three hour process of going back home and again, going back here and stuff like that. An experience that I experienced and kind of use it in a simulation as a guide experience, experimentations. I do these kind of things like uh, visually or digitally. So this, this kind of helps me to kind of see the boundaries, how far can I go and this kind of stuff. And here is again, I use this smartphone data here on this object or on this 3D model and kind of created this kind of, uh, out of these whole velocities that I extract from this data type. As you can see, I get the position from accelerometer data or data and out of gyroscope, I get the velocity. And out of that, I create this kind of a simulation on top of this body. And this can be brought into a larger scale. And what happens if we start to create really spaces, virtual spaces or real spaces based on this kind of data and use really uh, this kind of personal data as some kind of a input and not just uh, arbitrary or, uh, or designer-based parameters. And you can also scale things up. So the, as I mentioned, these are some thought experiments, personal thought experiments. And you can really go further with this whole idea and really create intricate and speculative geometries. So thank you very much. I think I'm done yet now. Why is that so dark? Okay, thanks for the for the three presentations. Um, probably what I will ask first is not to this to the speakers, but to the audience. Uh, whoever feels comfortable to switch on the camera, at least we can have any any vagueness of audience, let's say. And not just the, the names or black boxes. Um, so as I said, yes, thank you very much for the for the three presentation. I think it's great because the because of the wide range of of, of the different approaches uh, of using um, I would say at large computational design or digital means, right? Uh, from from as I see in in in, in Rupert's case, uh, more oriented uh, somehow toward the construction uh, of if if I can if you allow me to reduce this uh, um, to the construction of the structures uh, and in the sense that this is an improvement of of construction uh, processes that we all know that are extremely complex and difficult and messy from Andreas. Can give an impression of the contrary, right? But we are always fascinated in these clinches and and uh, and and the dirtiness of of what a process uh, or a logical process how to be corrupted, right? So again, I, I don't know how do you see this. If you can elaborate or uh, on on this idea of the imperfection of the 
of the of the digital uh, as such. I don't know, Rupert. I don't know if you want to start, just because you have the micro on. <laughs> <laughs> I can switch it off. No, um, maybe uh, I said the, the imperfection in computational systems, basically it starts, I guess everyone experienced that with um, the question on how exact do you need to be? I guess it's a question of how we formalize uh, uh, the, the aim and what we are looking for, I guess. Every one of us knows that we believe digital, as you said, we believe it's, it's a very exact thing. Architects always try to do the thing a bit abroad. I guess for my work, I just can say that although there is some imperfection also in fabrication and all these processes, they generate some imperfection, but they require a uh, a, a perfect model. So every milling pass should be very precise, although you know before it won't be precise after milling. So the play could go up or so there's always some happening, just air humidity is changing. So I, I believe that the question of imperfection is for architect or in, in, in my opinion for designs allows uh, design freedom. So I, I would say not sure if, if that would be true for um, Moomin's work. It, it looked to me kind of, there, there's parts that are very exact and then there's parts that are vaguely described. So I guess this vague information flow uh, is probably the thing that makes his work uh, unique or possible, I would say, if that answers your question. Andreas, Is that going almost, back to I'm, you, Gonzalo, or no? I mean, I, I said that the with the with the camera off. That <laughs> my goal here is just to for you to talk to each other, not, not just reflect on your questions. Yeah, so I please, totally agree on Rupert, for example. For example, in my work, I never tried to do a, some kind of a exact visualization of the data that I'm using. I just use the data as a parameter in my design process. So I just shaped the data output. So I think this is the way output. So I think this is the way. There's all these new technologies that we try to implement to, to dine in, in, in many ways. And then as uh, where the imperfection starts is as in, in this sense, and I don't know if you <clears throat> if you agree with that, there is, and the, I will connect the idea of of the black box, let's say, or the shortcut, with what you uh, call Rupert's uh, simplexity. What I really like how you how you explain it with the with the resopacy and so on. And this is uh, to some extent. What do you think? Obviously, the, the three of you is this somehow the investment. I'm coming. I'm somehow coming again to the same thing. Uh, how much do you think that one should uh, invest, let's say, in learning the tool? Many of these these the digital staff has a quite tough uh, learning curve, right? Um, in order to somehow misappropriate, how much do you need to understand uh, the tool you are having? In yeah, it's a bit about uh, what Rupert said, but it's also a bit about, I don't know, f f file management or what we want as an output of specific tools. It's like um, uh, you, for example, you will find various aliases of me probably in all sorts of fluid dynamics simulation forums all over the internet. There's always going to be the same guy who persistently asks how to get these meshes that are colored out of these programs. And none of these incredibly expensive and very sophisticated and very precise programs. Very few of them can actually export that mesh out. They produce it, they can visualize it, everything. And usually the answer is like, well, why would you? Because that mesh is uh, unprecise and you would not get any measurements out of it. And why would you? And in the end, there's a whole design opportunity in getting that data out of that program. And um, 
gives things a try so that yeah why would you need this this long melee pass and then we would try to implement it and then there's rather the question uh we didn't someone do it before is it really a good idea to do so and then probably architects are really like what we're doing is or what very often is happening is looking for a particular solution for a very particular problem to trying to solve that as fast and as creative as possible and then sometimes it leads or it forces you to dig as he until solves your problem i guess maybe that's the answer you just i stop digging in use uh, consciously what they have in hand with a with a particular purpose uh that uh, the massive uh, phase at the moment which is amazing because the opportunities are really cool but uh, i just remembered i think a year ago or so there's uh, there's an, an amazing um uh maybe Rupert, you know him actually host kichle who's like a, a, a German and he, he he does a lot on folding, actually building very complex shapes and how to turn polygon meshes into folding. And he then posted something like, uh, um, I don't know, a year ago on like Houdini in the 90s. And it was something, oh, nice to go back to Houdini. Last time I saw it was 1993. And I mean, the photo I showed of me painting that egg, that was like just a year earlier. And it's sort of like, I didn't know about it. And suddenly it's around. And I think that is because some people pick it up, um, uh, use a tool that is actually for the VFX industry and, and use that in the context only when the technology becomes accessible for us uh, to do things with it and apply it. That's an opinion. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. I would just, I, I, I guess can agree but what i really believe is also um applying new techniques you, you need you need a project or or a theme why you do it probably every one of us knows the situation there's this new software that is just somewhere and you open it you you i don't know you write the, the viewport and maybe you you dr drag some menus but if you don't have a, a product for it or an, an idea where to go then you probably um Will will not never start to explore. So just seeing an image and try to reproduce it, I guess it's not sufficient. I guess it's this playing around. It's always I would assume with with some sort of an idea, and even if it's just a a, a visual or something you would like to do. I mean, I have I have more. Sorry, do you want to go? Yeah, uh, I also want to just share my opinion on that regard too. For me personally, I'm still, I just recently graduated. But for me, it always was also the tool was never in the, in the how should I say it, in the foreground for me. I, I tried many different softwares in my, um, in my student career, let's say it that way. I really, how should I say it, it was always, it was always project driven. For example, in the last, I think, one year or, or so, I mainly work with, for example, Houdini or Unity. But, for example, two or three years ago, I never opened Houdini because I never needed it. So I needed it on some projects and I learned it and it was just that way. But my project at the end wasn't a Houdini project. It was just an architectural project of mine. And Houdini was just a tool to create this project. And I think a project shouldn't really have, or it shouldn't be driven by tools. And for an architect, we don't have to be ex experts in these kind of things. For example, I build up AI systems for my diploma thesis, but these systems was never, I, I couldn't do it by myself. I kind of copied this code from the, there and from here and and so on, and kind of build it like how should I say it, like a, like how we build uh, physical models. Like okay, put this here, put this there. Oh, it's working, nice. I can now use it. But I don't know how it's working, but it's working. So that's it. So I think that's why I, we don't have to be experts in this kind of tool tools uh, as soon or as long as we get the output. 
I mean, I have more more comments and so on, but probably it's also the audience. Uh, someone wants to uh, get involved, ask something, comment something. Uh, Yakomo, go for it. Take your time. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I mean, oh, it's not COVID. Uh, thank you, as usual. And I have to say, I think I really like this session. It felt really like a conversation or a faculty conversation more than the other sessions, I think. I don't know why, maybe I'm just more tired. Anyhow, um, I was thinking about, uh, because your work, I think, shows some kind of different degrees of an understanding of complexity, which I think it's quite a, I mean, it's the long discussions of digital technology. So according to some of digital design, let's call it like that. According to some, digital design has to be formally complex, otherwise it's not uh, interesting, or the other way around for others. And I was wondering what would be uh, your take on that, in the sense that, for example, Andreas, your work, uh, uh, complexity looks like a kind of an aesthetic notion in relation to performance. And I think that it's a really a shame that you were not selected for the symposium. Your work would have been a great fit, I think. Uh, and this is basically the reason for my question. Uh, and then in the case of Rupert, I also think that your simplicity, it's like this idea of uh, reducing, if I can say these words, the complexity to one single command, right? To a simple input that kind of produces a complex result, while in Moomin, uh, sorry for the pronunciation, uh, this idea of craziness that you mentioned and hybrid reality. So like what would be, uh, the role of complexity in your is it an aesthetic factor, a technical factor to play against, as Gonzalo was saying, or and is it really fundamental today to think about digital design or not? Well, I, I don't know. I, I need to say, in my case, you've assessed it properly. I can I can agree, um, and I, for me for me it is definitely a. Uh, I, I would really say I don't I would in, personally I would not even see it in a in a wider context. And since we're now continuing a sort of to have a conversation, as you said, rather than um, uh, for for me it, the, it is sort of like okay I'm I'm formally aesthetically fascinated with certain precedents. Um, as you see, my, my lecture, uh, lecture, my presentation is also a lot about sort of these forms from nature and so forth. And it's almost like a requirement in order to engage with it, um, because I am interested in that formal complexity. Of course, I could go down and look at the principles of these shapes, and they're usually very simple in that sense. Uh, it's, it's a lot of things in nature, so it's multiple simple steps after the other. Um, but I'm not interested. In it. I'm interested in the outcome and how you could achieve that and recreate it. So yes, I, I would agree that even outside the context, what is digital design now or post digital design or, or 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 any of those, for me it is a tool to engage with a formal language that I enjoy, and I couldn't do otherwise. Yeah, I'm not sure if I agree. I, I guess, I mean, well, for Andy's work, I I definitely agree. It's it's a tool. I, I think for what I am doing, it's more I have at least in the research projects to to reduce this complexity. Is driven because the more you want to do it, the the more people are telling you, yeah, but this won't work, and this part is too big, and this angle we cannot handle a machine or um, so I, I guess the the aim for reduction, as everyone, or at least I guess most people, it, it's a bit like driving a car. You you have this this handle, and then you have maybe gears, and then it, it starts. You, you don't need to know how how the engine works. It's just uh, maybe it was back in the days when you needed to know that. Now you're not even allowed to open it. So I guess. This reduction is, I feel, uh, my way to still be able to design something or to to have some design freedom within this amount of 
system uh, that pushes you towards something. Yeah, come on. I'm really sorry. Can you repeat your question, please? I can't remember <laughs> my question at the moment, but uh, uh, no, I, I think the awesome. overall thing was basically it wanted to be a compliment in the sense that there is now this idea that digital design should be like iPads or reduced to degree zero or near mm -hmm. zero degree. And I really appreciate it. I, I try to wrap it up like this and okay. give the work to someone else. Okay, thank you. So then, then probably I can I can directly target you a, a question, Mumun, that simply because your work is, is more, more uh, uh, in that direction of, I would say, the expansion, um, in a more direct way, the expansion of uh, how we experience uh, how uh, also what we understand as architecture, right? Beyond, let's say, the physical medium or the mediums of representation. So in this case, the... You at some point, I think you said that the simulation is somehow also the new real, right? So that what we understand as architecture again is this not just um, a physical environment? I think uh, as such, but you are interested in is it ultimately probably the question is that is this then for you architecture uh, a mode of experience? It doesn't matter whether it comes from a build uh, uh, medium or a digital one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. For example, for me personally, uh, when I was doing the, all the research, what I learned was that we are we are already simulating all the time our environments that we are inhabiting. Inhabiting, so which means. Oh, and or better said, let's phrase it that way, that I kind of use this kind of simulations that we create all the time based on our emotions, personality and stuff like that in order to create this kind of complex spaces. And how, and for me also, uh, we are spending so much time in cyberspaces virtually, not in kind of a space means. Uh, and I was like, how can we kind of merge the, these two things together by using really this embodied simulation that we create all the time in our heads, in our brains, consciously or subconsciously, as a parameter to design such spaces. And now with all the tools that we have access to, okay, they are maybe not that consumer ready yet, but in a few years they will. How can we use these kind of tools to really jump into that kind of space for a moment or for a few hours or do some activity inside by using really your parameters as design parameters? Because I kind of find sometimes when we, when we create something or when we use uh, procedural modeling or parametric modeling techniques, we use these parameters. Like sometimes it's sun sun parameters or sometimes it's just random parameters or arbitrary parameters i was like why using these kind of things and not something personal like social media does and yeah so that was mostly my goal or better said my interest in the design process i mean well while the conversation is, some, is somehow running um and coming back again to creation or misuse of, of something that uh, was not meant originally for architectural purpose. And I will reduce it quite a straightforward, let's say, to some uh, software packages, right? So you were saying that, um, or Andreas was also mentioning the idea of the accessibility um, uh, in different moments in time, et cetera, et cetera. But Again, at the core of these of these um, uh, softwares, there was not an architectural purpose originally behind, right? And I definitely think that this idea of the misappropriation probably came to the fore. The opportunities that somehow Giacomo was also pointed out, the idea of new aesthetics, new ways of approaching things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then we have also the, the other way around, right? We know that there are uh, from a decade or, or so, let's say. Uh, bean modeling, right? What is supposed to be uh, what came uh, to be for architects, 
And um, obviously, everyone has their own opinion about that and use it in in the in the right way. Even I don't know if there is a, a right way or not, but there is somehow an attempt to um, democratize, at least at the, from the point of view of the built industry or the relation of architecture with the built industry through these softwares, right? But we somehow see that in the creative process, this is not always that useful as, as it is. And we see in many, even in academia, right? So in, in, in between the academia and the practice, we see that it's very difficult to bring uh, this kind of, of uh, let's say, uh, uh, beam modeling as a way to, in the creative process. Um, and, and then the question is, it will be, do you think that research, but probably more hidden zone of like you were doing Rupert developing particular pieces of software through graph software or open, open source uh, platform and uh, platforms, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's very difficult, I think, because yes, BIM is, um, well, everyone has his meaning to BIM, but, but I think what what we lost kind of is with this BIM process, we, we lost a bit of um, space for, for creative new solution. It slowly gets there, I guess, with Dynamo and, and all these, these parametric tools that are now also part of uh, BIM modeling software, I guess what we should get back, I, I think, especially in Innsbruck, this is teached and sought by most people is getting um, back the, the control of the fabrication. So I, I think if, if the, the step of him, I would say it's an intermediate. And now like the designers, we learn, for example, with 3D printing or milling, there's processes that you can go directly to, to the machine uh, instead of having uh, I don't know, a, a BIM object that is the 3D printing thing, or I, I guess in some points, I would not say that BIM is evil or something like that. I would see it as a, as a chance to to get the control over it. I just think that we kind of need to educate uh, young architects better to kind of conquer the system or occupy the system and do what they want to do and not what the system wants to do. And I think from that perspective, everyone who digs into software to do what it wants to do um, uh, is on a good way to, to change these, these software companies or, or because now they have to give us access to their tools to their pathways. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I I agree with Rupert. I think this access to 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 those things is sort of like I think anything that breaks barriers is good. Um, in that sense, I think anything that makes things more assess accessible and more collaborative is I think always good in in essence. But um, on that topic, I just had to think, um, I don't know, last time we used the BIM software, I have to say it's about like four years ago, three years ago, actually. Um, but I did a, a, a CPD for the RABA um, on the future of construction. Don't ask how I came that about, but we were doing that in the, in the office I was working at that time. And sort of the whole thing came out sort of like is prefab the future. And then, of course, BIM came in all the time in terms of how much you can plan. And we looked at a lot of data. And in the end, we also looked at a lot of sort of like went to uh, not conferences, but sort of like conventions where there were a lot of like um, providers of solutions and fabricators there. And everyone was heralding uh, BIM, BIM, BIM is the future. And when you get down to it, the arguments were always like so much uh, energy is wasted in the construction industry. Uh, it is the least uh, digitalized industry in the whole world, but the biggest polluter and so on and so forth, you find it. And it's kind of interesting that the one part of the construction industry that is probably the most digitalized, um, so the, that gets innovated. 
right? So, so BIM then is sort of like, yeah, let's start at the architect who he or she is already sort of fairly um, sophisticated in terms of like this exchange of data and so for Melverse. And that doesn't eradicate, it doesn't bring the problem. So I, I'm sometimes within my only criticism with BIM would be, are you really getting more control over the, in that hierarchy, or, or let's put it timely hierarchy, later processes? Or do these later processes get some of the biggest uh, uh, architectural companies in the world were somehow demanding some being companies uh, that they haven't been developed so far in the last five years, right? And, and I don't know, I was rather somehow wondering if somehow what, what you were saying is, is this um, an investment that has to be done again for the early design phases in order to somehow enhance architectural creativity or create a more one line in between the whole process from creation, the, uh, production, construction, et cetera, et cetera, or somehow there was there, there was the, the, the thoughts behind that. Um, I don't know if if um, someone else want to want or someone from the audience want to ask or intervene uh, in the in the uh, it, is, it is true I'm always bringing these things instead of a conversation of a personal Q and A thing and I don't like it at all. Uh, but um, is there any comments from the topics that we are discussing here from the in the Okay. So in in that case, I don't know if if we can stop here the 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 event. Um, and I would like to thanks again the the three of you for taking the time for not just the presentation but also for preparing it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and 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 for the talk. And as we always say, uh, Florina and myself, I hope that for the others, these events are just to know each other a little bit more. Now we also know how Andreas looked uh, when he was uh, a child. And um, definitely this, this, take these this, uh, events as uh, again grabbing someone in a corridor and keep on talking or whatever things uh, pop up in this, in this discussion or in the presentations. But for sure there are much many that they want we can cover it. Um, that's been, been said. Thanks everyone also for attending. And uh, hopefully we can see each other soon in person. So then till the next time in April. Have a good Easter. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.